Good morning, church family. <laughs> I was just sitting there, um, told Julie on the way that she had, well, she asked me if I was nervous. I said, well, it's a bigger church. There are more people. So yeah, I'm kind of nervous. I taught Sunday school before in our church in Arizona, but not, I mean, it was usually like 30 or 40 people tops, you know, but I was just sitting there. I was looking at Bo and I'm thinking, you know what? I can't be nervous. I'm a grandfather. That's, that's like, like a patriarch, isn't it? Or, you know? But anyway, it's just been a while, so bear with me here. But, um, you know, I was just thinking when I was studying, I was thinking about the Word of God, and I was thinking about church, and I kind of gave a little testimony last week about this, but just what a joy it is to have God's Word. And what a joy it is to be in His house. You know, I know we're living in troubled times, and we are, but... Boy, that's the time we really need to dig in deep into the Word of God, right? I mean, amen? I mean, that's, you know, that's where it's at. That's where our answers are. That's where our comfort is and everything. But uh, let's, uh, let's put in here, um, in the lesson uh, plan there, it starts at verse 15. I'm going to overlap just a tad here and uh, put in at verse 14 and read down through the end of the chapter. I'm going to read all the scripture first, and then we'll, we'll go back and start from the beginning here, and we'll look at our... Uh, our lesson here, uh, verse by verse. In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider, God also has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things, and to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness of madness. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands as bands, who so pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found." Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the time in your house. Lord, thank you for uh, um, the opportunity to just study your word, to learn more about you, to learn more from your word. Lord, we need it. And Lord, I need it. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to teach, because I've learned, Lord, that uh, when I do do this, that uh, I learn more from the Word of God, and, and, uh, and just in preparing and studying, Lord, I just praise you, and I thank you for that. I pray that you just bless all of us. Help us to have ears to hear today. I pray that you bless the entire Lord's Day today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in your, uh, in your notes there, um, we're looking at this ninth lesson in this continuing study in the book of Ecclesiastes, when life is puzzling. And uh, I want to look at a, uh, some different verses here, but... Um, in your notes there, it says, what truth from Isaiah 55, 9 is confirmed in our inability to answer all of life's questions? If you want to turn there real quick with me, I'm going to look at that verse, actually a couple of verses there real quick. But in Isaiah 55, let me find it there. I'm going to look at verse 8 and 9, actually, because I think they're kind of companion verses. I think they kind of go together. You'll, I think you'll agree when you see this with me here. But verse 8 and 9 in that 55 chapter, or 55th chapter of Isaiah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways 
higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, when I was looking at those verses there, I was thinking about how, um, you know, just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. You know, and these are perplexing times, aren't they? I mean, I'm, I'm perplexed. I mean, I think I can, you know, agree with everybody that this election cycle has been pretty depressing, you know, pretty sad. But, um, you know, you see things happening in America that you don't think could happen. But here they are, you know, and here we are. But, uh, you know, I remember when I first got saved, I testified last week that I got saved when I was in the Air Force. It was actually when I was over serving in Greece, in the country of Greece. But uh, I remember they gave me a, a large print Bible as a gift when I got saved. I'm not sure why large print or whatever, but <laughs> I was pretty young. I still had all my vision then or whatever. But, but I remember somebody wrote in my Bible for me there, Proverbs 3, 5, 5 and 6, to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and, and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And that's how it's just stuck with me all these years, you know, and I, I constantly go back to those two verses, especially in times like these, you know, when there's so much happening that we can't, we can't understand. You know, um, <clears throat> the question there is, you know, about what truth do we learn from that verse or from those verses? I just wrote down in, in my notes that we're not God. We're not God. I think sometimes we forget that. You know, that God has reserved certain things for himself. There's certain things that we'll never understand. In, uh, in the, the uh, lesson plan in the book and everything, it talked about being able to understand things or seeing things clearly one day. And I believe that too. But I believe that there's some things that God has just reserved for himself. Some things we may never know. And we don't need to know. We just need to trust. Uh, what's that, Brother Wayne, yet you're always saying that we, don't, we can't uh, trace God, but we must trust him? You know? How important that is. Under uh, point number one there in your notes, remember you will see clearly someday. Amen. And then it uh, makes reference there to that uh, 15th verse. It says, all things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. <laughs> you know, if we're not careful, that's something that can become so depressing and so discouraging to us. Because we see the wicked prosper, and we see the righteous sometimes suffer, you know, and, and I think this is one of those times right now, you know, but, uh, but you, we know who wins in the end. What was it? Somebody was just saying that about the, the book of Revelation, and I forget where I heard this. It might have been from, uh, I was listening to Adrian Rogers here recently, but maybe somebody else said it. I don't know. If somebody here, I hope I'm not insulting you by saying that, but... But it was something about the book of Revelations, and this old guy was reading the book of Revelations, and the preacher, preacher guy asked him, you know, you know, he knew the scriptures, and he thought this old man probably didn't understand what he was reading. He said, do you understand the book of Revelation? He goes, yeah, I do. He goes, well, what does it mean? He said, God wins. <laughs> God wins. In the end, God wins. And that's right. And I think we, we need to keep sight of that, too. But uh, that question there in your notes, what will I be able to say in heaven according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 12? If uh, I could get somebody to turn there and read, actually read uh, verse 11 and 12 for us, if I could get a volunteer to do that. Some class participation here, maybe. <laughs> Any takers? Brother Chris? Thank you, brother. I just I asked Brother Chris to read that uh, 11th verse also because I, I think they are kind of companion verses there. Um, you know, what's characteristic of a child is that they think they know something that they don't know, okay? We were all teenagers once, right? Do you remember how smart you were when you were a teenager and how stupid you feel now? <laughs> I mean... I know that's how I feel. I mean, I remember, I remember a time in my life when I thought I had all the answers. And then I had children. 
You know, and I started raising my kids and everything, and I started asking for more and more advice as I went along. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like uh, you realize, you know, that's part of getting older and part of wisdom, I guess, that you realize that you're not as smart as you think you were. Okay, but we're always learning, right? But, uh, you know, there's always going to be things that uh, I don't understand or things that I, I don't know or even can't know. You know, those things are reserved for the Lord, like I said before. But under the second point there, refrain from becoming self-righteous. And I put in my notes here, self-righteous versus godly. Self-righteous versus godly. Because <clears throat> I think about this a lot. Self-righteous people, we've all known self-righteous people. And if you talk to people like that enough, they have their own brand of righteousness, which actually what they're saying is they're even holier or better than God. Okay, because a lot of times self-righteous people, they will make set up rules for themselves and they can't understand why other people don't follow their rules, their self-righteous rules, you know, and, and uh, instead of being godly, they have their own form of, of righteousness or own form of godliness, if you will. But if you look at verses uh, 16 through 18 there with me again, and um, I'm in the wrong chapter, I'm still in 1 Corinthians here, so I better get back to where I'm supposed to be. Verses 16 through 18, we read this. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand, for he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. <clears throat> I think about somebody who's self-righteous that thinks a little bit too highly of themselves. When I was in law enforcement, we had a saying for supervisors that were like that. We would say that they were a legend in their own mind. You know, they just, to them, they thought that they had all the answers and they knew everything, okay? But they didn't. And a lot of times these guys would make fools of themselves. And, and uh, But anyway, I think um, Solomon's saying something akin to that here. But um, if you look at, at uh, verse 18 with me again, uh, particularly the end of that verse, he says, For he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. They're far ahead. You know, that's, uh, there's this balance between thinking we have all the answers or even if we do have some answers and obeying God. Obeying God. That's the key. And, you know, what he's saying there in that 18th verse about he that feareth God. I've thought about that a lot lately, and I think that's a big problem that we have in our churches and in our society in general today. We don't have any fear of the Lord, you know, and I think we talk about revival, and I, we all want revival. I, I pray for revival. I know you do too, but I don't think we're going to see revival until we see the fear of the Lord come back, you know. I think if you look at all the great revivals that have happened in the past, I think they began with that godly fear. That fear, you know, I, I was uh, talking with the men here. We had a, a little prayer meeting here at the church at the altar uh, on election day. And I was thinking about these kings in the Old Testament, you know, that uh, I was thinking, thinking about uh, good uh, King Josiah and, and King Hezekiah. And when the, the words of the law were read to them, how they feared and they trembled. And uh, the prophet would tell them what, was, what God was going to bring to pass. And it was judgment. And they still feared and they still brought revival or revival was still begun even though judgment was coming you know and that's what we need I think we need the fear of the Lord or we need more of that uh, in all of, in all of our lives and in all of our churches today and certainly in our society but um, again you know the self-righteous thing I just one more comment about that and then I'll move on I was thinking about Ezekiel chapter 18, Julie and I were reading that in our Bible reading the other day, and uh, in Ezekiel 18, the Lord has a controversy with Israel. He says, he accuses them because they accuse him. They accuse God of his ways not being equal. And he says, are not my ways equal and your ways unequal? Okay, he corrects them in that. And, you know, that, I think, has a lot to do with this matter of self-righteousness, you know, personal opinions or personal likes or dislikes versus holy writ. Versus, thus saith the Lord. You see that in the scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. You hear the prophets say that a lot. 
thus saith the Lord. That's where, where our, our minds need to be, and that's where we need to be centered. But um, can I get a volunteer to read uh, Numbers uh, thirty-two twenty-three? that one verse, real quick? Brother Andrew? Just to give you the context of that verse a little bit, it was when the tribes of Israel were entering into the promised land and we had the two tribes and the half tribe that wanted to stay behind on the other side of the river Jordan and take a possession there. And they were cautioned that, you know, you need to go in and fight with your brethren and take the land first. And and they said that they would do that. But uh, Moses warned them that if you don't, be sure that your sins will find you out, you know, and... That is something that we need to consider when it comes to this matter of refraining from becoming self-righteous as opposed to obeying God. You know, your sins will find you out. There's a price to pay when we do that, in other words. Look at uh, point number three now, refuse to be judgmental. Refuse to be judgmental in verses 20 through 22. Let me read down through those here. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Also, take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. There's some good common sense there. You know, um, the Bible is a spiritual book. There's so much that we can learn from the Bible, but there's so much in the Bible, too, that's just common sense. Okay? But we need common sense, too, don't we? Sometimes we do things that don't make sense. That's why God gives us common sense. But we have it right here in the scriptures, you know. And I, I just looking at these, these three verses right here, I was thinking about that 20th verse and how it, how it so closely parallels a verse in the New Testament. I've been listening to Brother Chris teach these kids on the bus these verses, okay. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's basically what that verse is telling us right there. But... Um, refusing to be judgmental. Um, we have some verses here, in, in uh, actually a couple of verses that I want to read in uh, Psalm 37, if you want to turn there with me. Bear with me here a little bit. I'm, I'm not used to using a, a lesson plan. I I've never done that before. I've done it here and everything because I don't want to stray from what we're doing and everything. But um, it's hard for me going back and forth like this and everything. Sometimes I struggle with it a little bit. So just bear with me here. But um, in uh, Psalm 37, I want to read a couple of verses here. Verses uh, 23 and 24. Would somebody like to read that? Or if not, I'll read it. Somebody want to volunteer? Sister Linda? Uh, Yes, ma'am. I kind of wanted to add that, that uh, 23rd verse uh, to our notes and everything because I thought it, it kind of uh, was it kind of a sister verse to that 24th verse. I think the, the, the two kind of go together. Uh, but um, he says there, the steps of a good man are ordered to the Lord. Keep in mind now, this is a Psalm of David. Okay, and I can't help but think about him and his life. Okay, and I think here we could say the steps of a saved man for us, you know, to contemporize this a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, save man or order the Lord, you know, and, and uh, I wrote in my Bible here a long time ago, not suggested, you know, when we talk about being something being ordered, it's kind of like a military term, you know, we're, we're supposed to consult the Lord, and we're supposed to seek out God's will uh, when we make a move, you know, uh, in our steps, that's what the steps are talking about, but it says he delighteth in his way, and though we fall, David knew about that, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. You know, I was thinking of, of Israel and how many times the Lord, in the book of Judges alone, you see how the Lord continually delivered his people. And how many times he pulled David out of the fire. How many times David fell into sin. Uh, my daughter Rebecca and I, we were talking about this just the other day about David. She was saying something about how 
amazing it is how the Lord used David and how he's called a man after God's own heart when he sinned so grievously. And I said, well, you know why? Because he was a man that continually came back to the Lord, continually came back to the Lord. How many times men do that or they're caught in some sinful situation and they just continue in that? There's no repentance, but that wasn't David. There was genuine repentance in, in David, and he continually returned back to the Lord. But uh, in your notes there, uh, it asks the question there, what promise from these verses do we need to remember? You know, um, We're all susceptible to falls. Okay, We all need to remember that, and this kind of ties in with this idea of being self-righteous. We need to realize that we can yield to temptation. You know, we, we hear a lot about preachers, pastors, that fall into the worst type of sin. And they're the men that you would think would, that would never happen to. That's why it's so shocking to us when it does happen. But I think a lot of that is because they forget, those that do that, they forget that they're men and they're, they can be tempted, just like any other man, just like David was tempted when he sinned. But uh, under the, uh, I don't know, if did I read that, refuse to be judgmental? I don't know if I, I gave you that there. But uh, in that next uh, um, point there, in, in uh, that fifth point there, it says, how does Proverbs 15.31 express the fact that we need to listen to constructive criticism? You know, there's all kinds of criticism. We got a lot of critics today, okay, particularly in the media, okay, but... Constructive criticism is still valid, okay? We still need constructive criticism. We looked at this a little bit last week from uh, Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 6, where it talked about faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, okay? And we also are familiar with the term in the scriptures about iron sharpeneth iron, okay? We need that. We need that constructive criticism. Um, Sometimes that comes in the form of... uh, your wife or your husband, <laughs> okay, which is a little bit tricky sometimes, okay, but, but that's a good thing. I mean, we need, we need that constructive criticism, but uh, uh, somebody, if I could get somebody to read that verse in Proverbs 15. Somebody? Brother Andrew? Amen. Amen. We need that reproof, don't we? We need that uh, correction. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking about something when I was studying this morning. You know, uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but I got to say it, Hollywood's not our friend. Okay? Hollywood, these people, I hate to sound mean or whatever, okay, about anybody, but I don't want to listen to losers to tell me how to have a better marriage or how to have a better life or how to live or whatever. You know, unfortunately, I think that's one of the biggest problems we have today in our society, that people go to all the wrong people and all the wrong sources to get advice. Hollywood, why would anyone listen to somebody's advice from Hollywood, particularly about marriage? I remember reading an article one time in the doctor's office about an actor, I don't even know who it was, but they were talking about longevity in Hollywood marriages. And they were praising this one couple and everything, and then they, the bottom line was they were married for two years. That was longevity in a Hollywood marriage, I guess, or whatever, you know. But it's like, okay, forget that. <laughs> anyway, let's move on here. The fourth point, rely, rely on God's wisdom. And uh, for that, we're going to look at Uh, verses 19, and then skip down to uh, verses 23 through 26. God's wisdom here. They shall not be ashamed, and I'm in the wrong chapter again. (laughs) Bouncing all over the place. Back in Ecclesiastes here. Bear with me. In verse 19, we read this. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. Verse 23 now. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is far off and exceeding deep, who can find it out? I plied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness of madness. 
And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands is bands. Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. <clears throat> A few words here about wisdom. Think about who's writing this, Solomon. You know, he's credited as the wisest man that ever lived. Okay, the wisest man that ever lived. If you're familiar with how that came to be, in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 9, Solomon speaks to the Lord, and the Lord asks him a question. He says, what shall I give thee? Ask what I, ask what I shall give thee. However it's worded there, but uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the scripture. And what does he ask for? He asks for wisdom to rule Israel, to rule God's people. <laughs> You know, no doubt he was a young man at the time, and he knew that he didn't have a lot of answers. And God blessed him with wisdom and blessed him with so much more. And to me, it's baffling to me to see what Solomon does in his life after he gets that wisdom from God. We'll read about, read about that a little bit further here before we finish up this morning. But uh, it's to me, it's just amazing to see the road that he takes, particularly when it came to his political or arranged marriages that he had, all the women that he had in his life. It's madness. It's madness. A thousand, a thousand women in his life, 700 wives and 300 concubines. But anyway, um, let's move on here again. Um, you have the question there, question number six. What do the three Hebrew children tell King Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 18? Uh, Jeremy, can I get you to, to read that for us? Remember the, the statement here, relying on God's wisdom, and I think that's what the point here is in that question. You know, what do the Hebrew children tell King Nebuchadnezzar in this verse, okay? I'm just going to read the 17th verse in conjunction with this because I think we, we kind of need that too. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. And then you have those three words, but if not, but if not. I love that. I love that because that tells me that these three knew that God might not deliver them. God might not deliver them. All too often today in Christianity, we look at God as the one that's always going to bail us out. He's always going to fix it for us. He's always going to give us what we want. And when that doesn't happen, we get disillusioned. And I'm not talking about anybody here. I'm not talking about us or our church or anything. I'm just talking about Christianity in general. We've got a lot of this contemporary stuff out there today that teaches, uh, you know, it's a prosperity gospel. God wants you to have all this. He wants you to be successful. You know, it sounds strangely like what the world teaches. You deserve this. You deserve this. That's what you hear from the world. It's pretty, it's pretty close to that. But, um, but if not, you know, Obeying God no matter what. There used to be an old saying, you're probably sure a lot of us have heard it, a lot of us older folks in here, but uh, uh, obey God though the stars fall, something like that. You know, no matter what happens, in other words, just obey, just obey. You know, the old thing, I never really understood that when my parents said it to me, but when I had kids, I really got it, okay? When your child asks you why when you tell them to do something, and you say, because I said so, Okay. That speaks volumes because a lot of times God tells us to do things and we may not understand why. We may not understand why. But if we obey him, we'll see why eventually, won't we? But, uh, you know, that's, that's the way we need to look at it. Look at point seven there. When we lack wisdom, what does James 1.5 tell us to do? You know, that's a verse that I know that we're all familiar with. Um, let's just turn there, though. James chapter 1 and verse 5, about asking God for wisdom. Somebody want to read that? There you go. There you go. Solomon, again, Solomon knew about that. (laughs) 
he gave, God gave him wisdom liberally, didn't he? Liberally. We know about the wisdom of Solomon and uh, the things that he did. I mean, people came from all over, from different nations, to see and to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Okay, so he was, like I said, probably the wisest man that ever walked the earth. Uh, of course, other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But uh, Solomon knew all about that. So what do we do when we lack wisdom? We ask God for wisdom, right? That's what we need. And, you know, again, especially critical in days like this, in the things that we're facing today. And point eight there, what command does God give us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3? And I'm going to read verse 3 and 4 here. I'll read that. As soon as I get there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, we read this. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. You know, I wish we had a lot more young people here. We do have some, for which I'm thankful. But this is something that young people need to hear. What the Word of God says about premarital sex, sex outside of marriage. Right. Uh, that, you know, he, he uses that as an example, he, and, you know, or, or sin. We, you could easily say that, that you should abstain from sin, okay? It's not just for the young, it's for the old, too. It's for all of us, okay? But that, that word sanctification, that word means to be set apart, Okay? To be set apart for God's use. And I know I'm just about out of time, Brother Jason, so I'm trying to rush, trying to rush through here. I saw him walking up here. He's going to give me the boot or whatever and get me off, off the stage here. <laughs> anyway, I'm almost there. But anyway, um, <clears throat> to be sanctified, to have a sanctified life, you know, to be set apart. Where sin doesn't have a part. Where we don't let sin take root in our lives. Where we don't let sin control us. Uh, you know, we're going to fall into sin. We're going to sin. Because we're sinners, that's what sinners do. And when we get saved, that doesn't mean we suddenly become sinless. We don't, we don't find that in the Bible. But look at the fa fifth and last point here. Uh, refocus on who God wants you to be. And we'll read through the rest of this right here, and we'll be done. Back in Ecclesiastes. 27 through 29, through the end of the chapter here now. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. Just a couple words, and I'll close here. Um, I was just thinking about his statement there. This coming from the man who also wrote about the virtues of a woman or a virtuous woman, and also wrote uh, the verse in Proverbs 18.22, for time's sake, we won't turn there, but that verse talks about, he wrote there that he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. You know, all of us that are husbands, we know that we found a good thing, right? Amen. 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 Come on, men. Amen. Louder. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. <laughs> and I was thinking about my wife. Okay, I love my wife. I love her more than my 53 Chevy and my 40 caliber six hour. You know, I have to say that. <laughs> See, Tiffany? <laughs> I showed that to Tiffany on the bus the other night, and she said, why did you put that on your phone and not your wife? You know, but anyway, well, I told her I had a picture of my wife on there, and I asked Julie's permission, actually, Tiffany, if I could put, put my car on there. <laughs> I just had to say that to to uh, reinforce that and to stay out of trouble. So anyway, um, let's move on here and we'll close up here. But uh, in that 10th point, how does Isaiah 53, 6 express the truth that man has the ability to choose? If you're familiar with Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, that's all about the crucifixion. But it talks about how all we as sheep have gone astray. But, you know, we can choose not to do wrong. We can choose not to do wrong. I always wondered why it's so difficult for people to choose to do right, but so easy for people to do wrong. And I know it's because we have a sin nature, okay? But still, it's a decision. It's still a choice, okay, that we make. You know, in that last verse, he talks about the, something that he's found out here, that 
uh, God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. I think about the book of Genesis in chapter 6 when he talks about the imaginations of their heart were only evil continually. Why is it that man's imaginations and his inventions always turn out to be evil or usually turn out to be evil? Because of that, that wicked sin nature that's in man. Uh, we're so unique in, that we're made in the image of the living God. You know, and, and that's always been hard for me to understand why God's creation that's made in his image is the one that defiles himself. And I could go on, I could start preaching right from that point right there, but my time is up, so I better get out of here before Jason runs me off. So <laughs> thank you for your patience.